Uh, my name is Mark Gibb. Um, my wife Sasha and I are, are the owners of Gibbs 100 Brewing Company here on Lewis Street, downtown Greensboro. Um, and we are just coming up on our, our third anniversary uh, for the brewery. And um, Sasha and I have, 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 have uh, are both full time here. We're working. And we, we've got uh, two kids, uh, Carter and Kennedy, who, who uh, uh, are in here helping more often than they would like as, as well. So it's kind of a family affair. And like I said, we're coming up on uh, three years. How did you first become interested in the brewing industry? Um, and I, I know that's a one-part question, but for me that's kind of a two-part question. How did you become interested in brewing and how did you become interested in the industry? And, and, and I became interested in brewing 25 years ago when I, I started home brewing. Um, I like to, uh, to make things and, 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 and do things that give you a little bit of a creative outlet, you know, do a little bit of woodworking as well and things like that. So um, the idea of brewing appealed to me. I like, like I love beer and, and, and um, I like making things and um, and, and also I, I think that as a home brewer um, you have access to the same ingredients in terms of uh, the, the malt and the hops and yeast and everything that any brewery anywhere in the world has access to. Um, so you, you really can, if you're, if you're good at what you're doing, you can make the best beer in the world in your house. Uh, that's not true of everything. Um, that, I, I, don't, I don't believe that to be true of, of home winemaking because a, a lot of the qu part, part of the quality is, 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 is the work you put into it, part of the quality is the grape that you start with. And as a home winemaker, you just don't have access to those really tip-top grapes that are only found in certain chateaus in Bordeaux and so forth. Um, and that's just not true of, of, of home brewing. You, you can make the best beer in the world in your house. So that really appealed to me and, and that's why uh, I did it for 20 years before starting this brewery. Um, what got me interested in the, in the industry and in, 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 in doing it for, for a living, um, I had a career in manufacturing and actually started making equipment for breweries. Um, so for a period, uh, before starting this brewery, for a period of three or four years it was manufacturing brew houses and tanks and um, working with startup breweries to help get them going, figure out what kind of equipment they needed and build it for them. Um, and um, you know, just just seeing the passion of, of, of those folks for what they were doing kind of gave me the bug to to want to do it for myself. Why did you choose to open a brewery in downtown Greensboro? Um, when we did, uh, we're looking at opening a brewery. Um, you know, we, we were living in Stokesdale at the time, so we were not e even actually living in the city at that time. We, we do now, but um, we definitely wanted to be you know somewhere where there's you know a lot a lot of folks and, and things happening. Um, you know, we also looked at at Greensboro and, and and were surprised that there weren't more breweries, and we were looking at at. Asheville and Raleigh and Charlotte and other places and how many breweries they had and um, we just did not have that in Greensboro so so we felt that that was something that the you know, the city really really needed so we thought it was the best place to do it. Um, can you tell me a little about the challenges you faced while opening Gibbs 100? Uh, sure and, 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 and we faced a lot of the um, challenges that anybody starting any kind of business faces in, in, in terms of raising capital and, and, and finding good people to work for the organization and all kinds of things. Um, but we, we certainly had some that were, that were unique. Um, the, the first thing that we faced was, was that it was not legal to build a, a brewery downtown Greensboro. The, the zoning forbade it. Um, at the time, the zoning laws were set up around the idea that breweries would either be a brew pub uh, with, with full restaurant that would make a very limited quantity of beer and sell all of it on site. Or they'd be a big production brewery cranking out very large volumes and putting them into bottles and cans and selling them all over the place. Um, and they didn't want a big production brewery downtown Greensboro, understandably. Um, but the industry had really evolved and the business model had evolved and setting up a production brewery that did have bottles or cans in limited quantities, but also um, it had a tap room that invited people in and, 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 and uh, made a nice space for people to sit and have a few pints. Um, 
was the way most breweries were, were going at that time. And uh, that just wasn't envisioned in the, in the city uh, zoning ordinances. So uh, we made, brought that to their attention, um, you know, kind of made a case with some, some facts from, from Brewers Association and other, other places. And um, I have to say, it did not take a lot of convincing. I mean, I think they came on board very quickly with the idea, and, and then um, the city planning department were strong advocates when we went in front of the city council with it for their ultimate approval um, in terms of endorsing uh, what we were proposing. And um, so I, I, you know, I have to say, you know, a few hurdles we had to jump, but I was very happy with the way everybody worked with us on it. Um, and then once we got that going, um, you know, probably the other uh, piece that is, like I say, apart from just the everyday challenges that anybody starting a business faces is, is that a brewery is a very capital intensive business. There's a lot of equipment um, compared to 95% of businesses. So um, it was a serious challenge to, to, to fund that, to, to get all the pieces to to, to fit together, making sure that when you're ordering all these things that they're all compatible with all the other pieces um, um, and, and getting everything set up and calling in a whole bunch of different trades people from steam fitters to glycol fitters to electricians to plumbers to all kinds of folks to get everything all put together and working together. Um, so that, that, that was quite a challenge as well. Where did the name Gives 100 come from? Um, I'm a history buff. I do a lot of reading of history, and, and uh, 100 is, um, is an old subdivision of a county or shire that would support about 100 families. Um, it, you know, in the old days, typically two or three days horse ride away to get to the county seat if, if you had uh, some that had to go in front of the county court. And, and so they would subdivide the counties in, into hundreds and have a little hundred court that could handle matters of small jurisdiction, not a murder trial or something like that, but matters of small jurisdiction and it, it make it a lot more convenient for, for the people. And, and there were a few other administrative functions that, that would happen at that level. Um, Thomas Jefferson was a big advocate of the 100. He believed in keeping government small, keeping it close to the people. Um, and, and, and so we wanted to have a community brewery. It was a very community oriented and, and we felt that name kind of evoked community a little bit. Okay. So, how do you view your role in the community? Um, you know, I, I think the number one thing is is, is providing a, a space for people, and, and, and we get all kinds of groups coming in here from from uh, you know beard and mustache club to music groups uh, to uh, a lot of groups from UNCG to um, uh, various groups ad advocating for for social change to. Uh, just all, all kinds of different groups, and we'd like to provide a, a, a space where, where people can get together and, and, and talk about things. Um, I, I think we also, you know, take that in, into account when, when we're brewing our beer. I think that, um, you know, some, some breweries have, uh, you know, they, they like to um, go for uh, sort of the latest buzz of, 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 of a sour beer or a double IPA beer or something that um, is kind of the, the latest hot beer amongst craft beer connoisseurs. And, and certainly we like to have fun and do that kind of thing from time to time, but we also like to make sure that we're making beers for the average person that uh, isn't necessarily a you know, craft beer aficionado they, they may not even drink craft beer all the time. You know, they, they may, you know, <gasps> heaven forbid, go home and, and crack open a bud occasionally, you know. But um, if, if we have some nice drinkable beers for them to come in here and, and, um, and, and have some of those from time to time, then, then you know, again, they're, they're in here and they're part of the conversation um, as well, along with the, the whole community. What is it like to work in the craft brewing industry? Um, it's a nice industry to work in. Like I say, having been in manufacturing for 20 years, um, I, I uh, manufactured a lot of different products o over the years, and and um, a lot from automotive type products to uh, safety type products, and 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 um, and, and several other ones. And 
those industries can be very different. I mean, and, and, and some of them, um, just as I mean, as an exa a crazy example, the, the pickle industry. Um, I, did, I didn't work in the pickle industry, but I, I worked for a company that supplied a lot of equipment for pickle manufacturers. Very collegial industry. They get together at conferences every year, and everybody knew everybody, and they're always willing to share tips with each other of, oh, I'm having this problem with my pickle production line. Can you help me out? Oh, yeah, sure, you need to do this and that. Uh, very collegial industry. And it's sort of they're competing in the marketplace, but they're also w working, working together on, on occasion. Um, other industries, just bitter, bitter competition. And anybody who works for your competitor company is, 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 is a bitter rival. You don't, don't even talk to them. Um, so it, it's very nice to be in an industry where it's more collegial. And the, and the craft brewing industry is, is probably that way more than any other industry I've ever seen. Um, so it, it, it's a very nice industry to work in. Yeah. What is the Triad Brewers Alliance? Triad Brewers Alliance is a, a group of uh, triad breweries as well as some um, associate members who are not breweries but, but are, supply things for the brewing industry and are supporters of the industry that have also joined us. Um, and uh, it's just been going for um, well under a year now, but um, we get together to uh, start promote brewing in, in the triad and, and the reputation of the triad. Um, a lot of folks going to Asheville and, and Raleigh and Charlotte um, for, for beer tourism to say, hey, I'm going to go there this weekend, I'm going to hit up eight, eight different breweries and, 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 and go around and, and taste their products. Um, we don't get a whole lot of that here. I mean, I travel all around the state um, selling our beer. It's, it's available wholesale all around the state. and. Um, I go to a lot of places and they say, where are you from? Well, I'm from Greensboro. And they say, oh yeah, I, I drive through there all the time. Do you ever stop? Do you ever get off the interstate? Uh, well, no, I never do. Well, we're, we're trying to change that. We're trying to get folks to come out and say, hey, there are a lot more breweries in the triad than I, I recognized. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a trip out there this week. And I'm going to visit four or five of them. Um, and so we, we, we do that through um, uh, some events that we do to highlight Triad Brewing. Um, the biggest beer festival in this area right now is a summertime Bruce Fest that, that Rock 92 puts on. And of course that's got breweries from all over the place. And, and we get people coming in from all around to come to that. Well, we started doing a little event the night before for all folks who are coming into town for that event. And that, and, and that event focuses only on Triad breweries. So we don't get kind of lost in the noise of the big festival with 200 breweries in there. It's, hey, just come out and just try the triad brews. And um, so we've got that event going. We we're uh, working on a, another annual event that we'll have released yet, but that will be a kind of a big keynote annual event for us. Um, working on a web page and, and, and uh, uh, brochures with brewery maps of the area uh, to point people in the right direction and all that kind of stuff. How has the brewing scene in Greensboro changed since you opened three years ago? Um, it's changed pretty dramatically, and um, a lot of breweries have opened up. Um, and um, you know, I, I, I mean, I think that's great. We're starting to develop a, a brewing scene. Um, you know, obviously, as 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 a brewer, you know, like I said, there's a lot of collegiality in the industry, and you work with folks. But you know, you are competitors also, so there's always that tension, and and. Um, you know, so sometimes we, uh, you know, get a little disappointed if our taproom business is down a little bit because everybody's over at another brewery tonight because they're having a big event. Um, but I think I think by and large, you know, having the breweries is 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 um, teaching more and more people about craft beer. People who were not craft beer drinkers are are are, are, are um, they've got a more of an opportunity to to try it, and then once they try it, a lot a lot more people will say, oh yeah, you know what, I think. You know, maybe I'm not going to drink craft beer all the time, but if we can just get them to drink craft beer 25 or 30 percent of the time, then we're, we're growing the, the market for craft beer, and, and we're and you know we're doing that together. So a big change coming up for Gibbs Hundred is your move out of downtown to State Street. Can you tell mm -hmm. us more about that? Sure. We're um, um, you know, like I said, we've, we've been lucky enough to experience some growth, and, and and we are distributed around the state now, and. Um, 
it does take a little bit more equipment and space and whatnot to, to meet the production requirements when you're distributed in a, in a hundred counties as, as opposed to just kind of being available in your local area. So um, a big part of, of the move that um, for, for us is, is getting a little more space um, and, and we've, you know, we've loved being here, but this this building is over 100 years old, and, 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 and there have been some challenges in trying to get the production out, and we're, we're meeting those challenges every day, but um, it'd, be, it'd be nice not to have to fight those every day. Um, uh, so a, a big part of it is for production, and, um, but, but also as, as well for our tap room. I, I think that um, it's been wonderful to be downtown here, and, and, and um, it's exposed us to a lot of folks who um, otherwise wouldn't have known about us if we were out in an industrial park somewhere on the edge of town. Um, but I think now we, you know, we've built a little bit of a name for ourselves. I think folks know who we are, and I, I, th I think we can uh, survive making a little bit of a move. And I think in the new location, what we want, what we want to do is have a really nice outdoor beer garden. Um, you just don't have that kind of space to do that downtown. Um, we, we've got a nice uh, 0.86 acre lot where we have a really nice outdoor beer garden with some mature trees on it um, and uh, you know some music outside and events and stuff like that. So um, we we like to sit outside and drink beer and we think other people do too and, and so we want to afford them that opportunity. Where do you see the brewing industry going in the next five years? Um, We've had an explosion of growth in the industry. I think that's been um, fantastic. Um, I think that that growth will probably, you know, level off a little bit. I mean, um, I think, that, you know, pe people who look at the industry, um, there have been folks who say, oh, there's going to be a big crash. There's just too many breweries. Um, I don't, I don't believe that. I mean, the, the, we've got over 5,000 breweries now, but there's also 8,000 wineries in this country, and nobody's saying there's going to be a big crash in, of wineries. Um, so I don't think we're going to have anything like that, but I do think we'll have a, a little bit of a leveling off in, in terms of um, not so many new breweries starting up. Um, and, and I do think that uh, breweries uh, going forward will we'll have to you know, f focus a little bit more on who they want to be as, as a brewery. I mean, I, I think if you roll the clock back 10 years, I think every brewery that started up in their back of their minds thought, well, someday I'll be the next New Belgium and I'll have a huge brewery and I'll be um, distributed in 35 states and I'll uh, you know, be putting out 800,000 barrels of beer a year. Um, not a lot of room for that anymore. Um, but I think that there's a lot of room as long as everybody wants to kind of focus on focus on their knitting and, 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 and do what they do best. And 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 and, and uh, um, uh, you know, if this brewery over here is going to do sour beers, and this one over here is going to do English beers, and this one here is going to focus on having a nice little tap room, and this one here is going to focus on um, distributing their beer across a certain region or whatever. And everybody's got a little bit different way of doing things and a little bit different business model, then there's room for all of us to do that. But um, you do have to focus on what that business model is and making sure you're, you're sticking to it and all your investments are lining up with that. Because um, there isn't as much, with as many competitors in the industry, there isn't as so much leeway to just, well, I'm just going to get out there and make some beer and see what happens. There's not too much leeway for that anymore. So. Um, you know, I, I think as an industry, we have to just kind of focus on, on, on what our business model is, who our core customers are, and making sure we're keeping them happy. Okay. So you talked a little bit earlier about making beers that are more drinkable. What styles of beers do you like to focus on here? Um, our biggest selling beers are ESB. And, you know, from, from the beginning, we never picked out a beer and said that's going to be our flagship beer. Um, what we actually did when we started is, is we started with, with five beers and we had, um, we had an e ESB because that's a kind of a malt forward kind of beer. We had a milk stout because that's, that's a, a 
nice dark and roasty beer with just a little hint, a touch of sweetness to it. Um, we had uh, a Berliner beer, which is a beer that's got a, just a little nice tart sourness to it. We had um, a pale ale, uh, which is which is just kind of a nice middle of the road drinkable beer, and then we had an IPA, which is you know very hoppy beer. So we were kind of trying to hit all the different taste points of of, of different things that beer can be, and we said, well, whatever people like, we can brew more of it, no problem. Um, well, the, the market kind of decided that our ESB was our flagship beer. We, we, we won a gold medal from the Great American Beer Festival for it, and then the sales of that product just really zoomed after that. So it, it has definitely become our flagship, and, and we're very proud to have it as our flagship. We're, um, I mean, I think um, you know a lot, a lot of breweries don't feel like you're a real brewer unless your flagship is a double IPA, and, and we're very proud to have that as our flagship beer. And, and like I said, we didn't, we didn't pick it. The people picked it, and, and we're happy that they did. Um, so, the, but it's a very approachable, drinkable style of beer. Um, our pale ale is a very approachable, drinkable style of beer. Uh, most of our seasonals that we'll come out with is saisons and French blondes and brown ales. We try to make nice, approachable, drinkable beers. Um, you know, we. we we like to do limited release beers and do barrel aged beers and do very high ABV beers and very hoppy beers um, and, and, and they're fun and, and we, we do them on a regular basis but we want to make sure we're always putting things out there that um, that can appeal to a wider crowd as well. Okay and what is your favorite beer to drink from Gibbs Hadred? I mean you know you might as well ask me what my favorite child is I mean you can't you know you're not allowed to pick you know um, but I, I, I drink all of them depending on the weather and my mood and, and everything. Um, you know, I, I probably find myself going back to the pale ale more than more than anything else. Uh, but 